This man went on a terrifying crime spree in Philadelphia, ending in a shootout with police. According to police, Stanley Cochran's rampage started at around 3am on the 8th of October 2020. He came across a woman in a church and he demanded that she drove him somewhere in her car, but she refused. He then stole her car keys, stole the car and then crashed it. Shortly after 4am, he then attempted to carjack 19-year-old Skylar Owens. He actually shot at her while she was driving. Moments later, she crashed into some parked cars. Her male passenger was hit by bullets and escaped the vehicle. Tragically, Skylar was pronounced dead at a nearby hospital. She was described by friends and family as a beautiful soul. Luckily, the male passenger survived. When police tracked Stanley down, he refused to drop his weapon and he opened fire on police. A shootout with police began. Stanley was later rushed to hospital, but he died from his injuries. My baby was decapitated at birth by the doctor and she even tried to cover it up. My name is Jessica Ross, and my husband and I were looking forward to the arrival of our first child. On July 9th, 2023, we went to the nearest hospital after my water broke. What should have been the most wonderful day of our lives turned into a nightmare. After 10 hours of labor, the baby became stuck, prompting Dr. St. Julian to attempt an extraction. Unfortunately, his actions were so brutal that the bones in the baby's skull and face were broken. I was subsequently transferred to the operating room for a cesarean section due to the risks associated with my pregnancy. During the operation, my belly and uterus were opened, revealing that the baby had no head. The medical team discreetly removed the head stuck in my body. When the doctor handed me the baby, it was wrapped in a blanket, and the head had been artificially attached to the body to give the impression that everything was normal and that my baby was alive. When I discovered the shocking truth, the medical team strongly advised against an autopsy, going so far as to recommend cremation. This teacher did something sick to a teenager while her baby was in the backseat of the car. Tatum Hatch is a 32-year-old high school teacher from Louisiana. Up until recently, she was working at West Monroe High School. She was recently arrested for essaying a 15-year-old schoolboy. She apparently told the boy that she wanted to be his first. She is now also accused of inappropriately touching him in her car while her baby was in the back seat. Now, the boy had apparently confided in his dad and eventually told him what had been going on. He told him that the teacher had been sending him inappropriate, explicit messages on Instagram initially. He then admitted that the teacher for a year and a half had been SAing him. Police interviewed Tatum and she admitted to speaking to the boy via Instagram. She was put on leave by her employer, the school, and is charged with computer-aided solicitation of a minor. I pushed my 79-year-old mother down the stairs and hit her with a can of bolognese sauce, and then she died from her injuries. My name is Nicole Wabaking, and I am 49 years old. The house I live in belonged to my mother, and I was renting it from her. However, I started experiencing financial difficulties and struggled to pay her the rent, so there were several occasions when I couldn't pay her as I should have. In addition to all these problems, some neighbors contacted my mother informing her that I was making noise at night and disturbing the neighborhood. On numerous occasions, my mother tried to call me, but I purposely didn't answer. That's why on June 27, 2023, she decided to come to see me in person for explanations. I didn't want her to enter my house, but she insisted, and very quickly we argued about my neighborhood issues and my rent arrears. I was furious and suddenly I pushed her down the stairs. She fell very violently and I went into my kitchen, grabbed a can of sauce and hit her with it. My mother managed to leave and called the police, accusing me of assaulting her, and she was transported to the hospital because of the injuries I inflicted. But a week later, my mother died from complications related to her injuries. So this went from being an assault to a murder. What judgment do you think I deserve? A child who is missing since 2019 has been found alive under a staircase. Four-year-old Paisley Schultes was removed from custody of her biological parents along with her sister. Although it's not been revealed as to why, her parents Kim Cooper and Kirk Schultes were no longer legally allowed to look after the girls. In July 2019, Paisley vanished from her family home while her older sister was at school. She'd been living near Ithaca, New York. 
Although police strongly suspected her biological parents, they had absolutely no proof. Police were actually able to search the parents' property. They denied having anything to do with this and the police could not find the girl inside the house. Years later, however, in 2022, police received a tip off that the little girl may be in the house after all. Although at first it seemed that nothing was off about the property, after about an hour, one of the detectives realized something odd about the stairs. Acting on gut instinct, they looked a little closer and eventually found a small hiding place. When they were able to get a little closer, they found Paisley hiding in the small space. The couple were charged with custodial interference and endangering the welfare of a child. At age 13, Alicia Kozak was targeted by an online predator. After grooming her for months, on the 1st of January 2002, he abducted her from her home in Pittsburgh. Now, Alicia had snuck out of her house to meet up with the friend that she'd been talking to online. The next thing she knew, she was bundled into a car by a man. Alicia was startled when she looked in the back seat of the vehicle and saw handcuffs and a rope. Over four days, she endured horrific torture and essays. Her captor was Scott Tyree. He actually decided to live stream the horrific ordeal. Thankfully, somebody saw the live stream and recognized the girl from missing persons posters. The FBI were notified and they tracked Scott's IP address. On January the 4th, Alicia was rescued when the FBI stormed the property. They tracked down Scott at his workplace about half an hour later. Shockingly, they discovered that Scott actually had a 12 year old daughter who actually wasn't staying with him at the time. In 2003, Scott was given 19 years and seven months in prison. He was released in 2019, but was then sent back after violating parole. He was released yet again in 2021. Alicia now has a master's degree in forensic psychology and has dedicated her life to educating people about the dangers of the internet. These are deaths caught on audio, part one. On January 26, 1967, three crew members were conducting a launch rehearsal at Cape Kennedy Air Force Station Launch Complex. The launch was scheduled the following month. The simulation was needed to determine whether or not the spacecraft would operate normally. And because the spacecraft wasn't loaded with fuel, it wasn't considered to be a dangerous exercise. At 1 p.m., the command pilot Gus Grissom, senior pilot Edward White II, and pilot Roger Shaffey entered the command module in their pressure suits. Immediately, Gus noticed a strange smell circulating throughout his suit, which he compared to sour buttermilk. The crew was going through their checklist when a violent fire broke out. And all three men's microphones caught it all. Just take a listen. It's also worth noting that there are aftermath photos of all three astronauts, and they are very bad. I really don't recommend looking them up. In September of 2011, two young men broke into Craig Stockard's home in California. On that day, the robbers were looking for anything valuable in Kevin's house. This all took place in Delhi, California, a town pretty close to Sacramento. These young men searched all of Craig's property and they eventually ended up in his barn where they found a number of what they believed were blank CDs. After the two young robbers fled the home, Craig called the police himself and reported the robbery. But when the boys returned to their home and began looking at the CDs, they discovered something absolutely disturbing. On those CDs, they discovered CP or CSAM, AKA lewd images of minors and yes, children. Apparently Craig had stockpiled hundreds of these videos and photos. And this led the robbers to rat on themselves and call the police. Eventually, Craig's home was raided and yes, he was arrested and imprisoned for possession of CP or CSAM. According to authorities, he had been downloading these images and videos for over seven years. And it turned out that over 30 of those 50 CDs that the boys stole from Craig's home contained CP or CSAM. And I can't find any clear resolution on this story, but according to what I'm reading online, the two burglars who reported Craig never were arrested themselves. So in committing a crime of their own, they busted someone for committing an even worse crime. 
Kind of strange how that worked out, isn't it? Tachi Uchi, the most radioactive man ever. Oh, yeah, I've seen this before. On September 30th of 1999, him and two other technicians came into work, and the power plant was two days behind schedule. So they were rushing to get everything done. They went to a station where they had to put in a mixture into a tank, but the tank that they were using wasn't made to withstand the amount of radioactive material that they were using. So it ended up causing an accident, which they called a uh, criticality. When that happened, created a big ass bang. A bright blue light filled the entire room since Hisachi was closest to the tank the radiation went right through his body he was exposed to double the amount of radiation that gigahertz sieverts that a fucking human could survive he started vomiting he started feeling lightheaded he ended up passing out then he was airlifted to a hospital and the nurses were surprised on how he survived or how his body looked so good because he had no lacerations no cuts on his body they took his blood work for testing so whenever the whole explosion happened his chromosomes got fucked up they so basically they got, got ripped apart scrambled which meant he had no blueprint he couldn't reproduce cells anymore and the reason why he looked alive was because his body had already reproduced cells before Yeah, because your body's in a constant cycle and exactly shit. he was in the walking ghost phase which meant his body appeared alive but his body would decompose and basically become a corpse while he's alive time passes his skin is slowly falling off even when the nurses put medical tape it would rip little chunks of like his skin off and for the next 83 days he was kept alive while the doctors and nurses basically kept him as a guinea pig because this never happened before to anybody but you have a picture i do actually do not watch this video if you're home alone this is the hideous story of the boy in the walls tina bowen was living in massachusetts Tina's mum had sadly passed away, but Tina began hearing strange scratching noises from within her walls. She was convinced that it was her mum trying to communicate from the dead. The reality of the situation, though, is so much more horrifying. For weeks, Tina was haunted by cryptic messages that scribbled into the walls of her home. Items would also mysteriously vanish and then reappear in a different place. She was convinced there was a poltergeist in the house. Then one night in December 1986, Tina and her dad came home to a sight like that out of a horror film. A figure was stood in the wardrobe with a painted face, a ninja mask on and a hatchet in his hand. The pair were then forced by this masked man into a bedroom. Luckily at this point, he then went into another room. So this gave Tina the opportunity to run and call police. Officers raced to the scene and found that Daniel LaPlante had actually been living within the walls of Tina's house. He'd been there for weeks, taunting her. Now, Tina had actually dated Daniel, but she had no idea that he'd secretly been living in her house. However, this horrifying tale is far from over. Whilst out on bail, in December 1987, he actually broke into the house of a pregnant nursery teacher. This was Priscilla Gustafson. Daniel awed her and then shot her multiple times and then drowned both of her children. They were only seven and five years old. Priscilla's body was found face down in her bed. Daniel was given three life sentences. Have you ever seen this picture right here? Yeah, I have. So that's real. That's real? That's a real life person, bro. I thought it was like some GMOD or some AI. That's real, bro. So what the f*** is that? It was this doctor, William Bailey. He was a self-proclaimed doctor. And basically, he ended up making this magic potion. That is what he called it. And it was called Radithor. Which basically was just radium mixed with water. What the fuck is radium? It's a very, very highly radioactive substance, bro. Don't tell me he not, drinks not it. And supposedly, it's supposed to cure anything that you're feeling. Any pain, weakness in your body is supposed to kill it. Also, improve your sex drive. So this guy, even Byers, he ended up injuring himself. He was a professional golf player. And he ended up injuring his arm so it was hindering him from doing anything and he was also losing ability in the bed he started realizing that as he was using it he was feeling benefits and then he thought huh if i feel like this now imagine how it would be if i take more so he's taking like 10 times more than the regular dose than what the doctor prescribed over time he ended up getting sick so he ended up giving himself cancer he was thinking that by taking more of it he was going to feel better but it just had the opposite effect he started feeling that his teeth were loose and they ended up just popping out oh to the point God. where he lost his whole his whole Teeth. teeth and his whole jaw and a lot of people were taking this shit bro and it was because that guy bailey he was telling doctors do you prescribe this to people the true story behind this mugshot is incredibly disturbing so viewer discretion is advised this is 23 year old roberto silva jr in 2020 he shot and killed two employees at a sonic in nebraska wounded two others and set fire to the building so the week before Roberto went on this murder spree at the Sonic, he had actually been arrested at the same Sonic for identity theft. 
This is the Sonic where all this happened in Bellevue, Nebraska. And just a few days before the shooting, Roberto was arrested after he used an app that belonged to someone else to purchase $57 worth of food at this Sonic. When the person whose account Roberto used reported this to the police, he was arrested and obviously this enraged Roberto. And just a few days later, Roberto showed up to that Sonic with a U-Haul. On November 21st, 2020, Roberto showed up to the Sonic in a U-Haul. He threw an incendiary device inside of the Sonic trying to light the place on fire. He then tried to light the U-Haul on fire. People thought that there might have been a bomb in the back of it, and he opened fire on the employees with his handgun. Sadly, two of the employees that were working that night would go on to pass from their gunshot injuries. 22-year-old Nathan Pastrana and 28-year-old Ryan Helbert. And thankfully, the other two people that were shot that night made full recoveries. After his arrest, though, when Roberto was brought into the police station, he smiled in his mugshots. And it looks like he doesn't even have an ounce of remorse in him for his terrible actions. Quickly, the media dubbed him the Smiling Shooter or the Sonic Shooter. And in 2022, Roberto pled guilty to all 15 charges and is now serving a life sentence in prison. Roberto even sent a letter admitting to the crime, stating that he intended on killing the people that were witnesses to his identity theft crime. He basically wanted to make sure that nobody could rat on him. And I think knowing the story behind this mugshot makes it one of the creepiest that I've ever seen. Summer of 2021, 15-year-old Ivan Poteshnik was brutally murdered by one of his close friends. This is his story. On May 26, 2021, Ivan was invited over to his friend's house in Taylorsville, Utah. His friend was 17-year-old Rowdy Aguilar, and the two were reportedly really close, having grown up together. That morning, at around 10 a.m., the two were seen entering Rowdy's house on the home security footage. A few hours later, Rowdy was seen leaving the house by himself, carrying a black garbage bag into the field behind his house. Not long after, Rowdy's dad was looking for him inside of a utility trailer on his property when he discovered Ivan's dismembered body and called 911. After searching the property and the field behind Rowdy's house, authorities discovered multiple garbage bags filled with Ivan's dismembered body parts. And after searching Rowdy's bedroom, they found a bloody t-shirt and knife. According to the police, the home also smelled really strongly of cleaning agents. Rowdy was then taken in for questioning, where he initially denied even knowing Ivan, despite the fact that they grew up together. His hands were covered in scratches, and when asked about that, he told authorities that the wounds came from cutting ribs for a barbecue. Rowdy told authorities that he was with his girlfriend on the day of the murder, but after police found more of his clothing covered in blood, he confessed to killing Ivan. According to the medical examiner, Ivan was stabbed 26 times in the head, with one final wound to his neck before being dismembered. Rowdy was arrested and has since been charged as an adult with aggravated murder, desecration of a human body, and a few other charges. The trial has yet to take place, and there's still no motive or explanation as to why Rowdy did this to one of his best friends. But according to Ivan's sister, Rowdy told prosecutors that he didn't believe Ivan was human. Ivan was described as having the biggest, most loving heart and was a gentle giant. The two years prior to his death, Ivan lost both his mom and his dad to cancer and a heart attack. And as a 15 year old, that's incredibly hard to go through. He was looking forward to being in high school and playing football and getting a job and just doing kid things. I wanted to include this short clip of Ivan before he died with his grandpa that showed just how caring of a person he was. I got you, I got you, I got you, I got you. Holy shit, I got you, I got you. Okay? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Not to mention fall, I promise. This man accidentally recorded his own death, and whatever you do, don't look up the video. For some people, deep waters scare the living hell out of them. But for others, it's kind of a thrill. And this is the case for 22-year-old diver Yuri Lipsky. He was a qualified scuba diver and he loved a challenge. And the Blue Hole, which is in the Red Sea of Egypt, presented quite a challenge. The underwater life is vibrant and colorful. The corals below are something out of a fantasy movie. To many divers, this is the dive of a lifetime. About 184 feet below the ocean surface is something called the Arch. And it's a horizontal tunnel that leads from the vertical shaft of the blue hole to the open sea. And then the very bottom of this is a little over 300 feet deep. On April 28th, 2000, Yuri Lipsky would begin his dive into the blue hole, and he would not come back alive. As part of the gear he was using, he had a camera strapped to him to record the beautiful journey. He also only brought one tank of oxygen, and he had weights strapped to his sides. 
But what he doesn't know is about seven minutes from now, he would be dead. He made it to the arch and from there he continued to go down. You can view the video of this whole thing on YouTube, but it's very uncontrolled, it's shaky, and honestly frightening after you know what happens. He would then land with a thud at the bottom of the blue hole, and at this point they believe he was suffering from nitrogen narcosis, which happens when you're breathing air under extremely high atmospheric pressure. And it also affects your higher functions, you begin to have these feelings of euphoria that basically creates a delusion that you're completely okay but you're really not at all and it also screws with your concentration you have no idea what's going on and you don't know where you are and for some reason yori then removes his breathing apparatus you hear yori gasping for air and you can tell by the movements of the camera that he is thrashing back and forth for a breath you can hear him literally struggling to breathe and as you hear yori struggling to breathe and shaking all around the camera then goes still, and this is the image where he died. This is just awful, and I really don't recommend watching the video of it. Rest in peace to Yori Lipsky, and I really can't imagine going out like this. Talk about a woman on a mission. This is Anne Ming, and she took on the British justice system to put her daughter's killer behind bars. It took 15 years, but she did it. Anne's daughter was brutally murdered back in 1989 and tragically her body lay undiscovered for three months behind a bath panel in her home while her killer Billy Dunlop bragged about getting away with the perfect murder. Mother of one Julie Hogg was just 22 when she went missing in 1989 and despite around 30 police officers searching her home multiple times she was nowhere to be found. Three months later, while Anne was in the house with Julie's three-year-old son, she noticed a smell coming from the bathroom. It was then that she discovered her daughter's body stuffed behind a bath panel. She'd been subjected to a vicious sexual assault and she'd been strangled to death. There was only one suspect and that was Julie's boyfriend, Billy Dunlop. But despite two trials, neither jury could come to a decision and he was acquitted. Sickeningly, Billy actually went on to assault another woman and he did end up in prison. It was here that he confessed to murdering Julie, but said that he knew he couldn't be convicted due to an 800-year-old UK law. The double jeopardy law meant that an individual could not be charged twice with the same crime and he'd already been acquitted. He was proud of the fact that he'd committed this disgusting act of violence, taken someone's life and got away with it. Anne knew that this man had murdered her daughter and she decided it was down to her to change the law and have him convicted. It took 15 years, but she did just that. In 2005, the double jeopardy law was overturned and in 2006, the case was reopened and Billy Dunlop was charged with Julie's murder. He was sentenced to life with a minimum of 21 years and he became the first person to be charged twice with the same crime. He admitted to murdering Julie after going round to her house after a stag do. He subjected her to a horrific assault, strangled her to death, stuffed her body behind a bath panel and then left her there. Nothing could bring Julie back, obviously, but Anne was over the moon that they finally had justice and a sense of closure for Julie's son. Now, after serving 17 years, 60-year-old Billy Dunlop is up for parole and his hearing will be held in public this year. If he's successful, he could be a free man once again. This is by far one of the worst cartel videos ever released and this is a massive trigger warning. The brutal video that I'm about to explain takes place in an empty concrete room with no furniture. It looks like a scene straight from a Saw movie. As you play the video, you are immediately met with blood, and I don't say that lightly, there is literally blood everywhere. At first, when you see the victim, his torso looks like it's wrapped in saran wrap, but it's actually the shade of blood which reflects off the light. Upon playing the video, it's hard to tell if the victim is dead or alive, though his heart seems to be beating, as blood is leaking at an insane rate. The cartel member can be seen cutting the victim's throat with what appears to be a kitchen knife. After quickly slashing the victim's throat, the cartel member then takes the knife and cuts around the victim's face. From the top of his hairline down to his chin, it appears he's attempting to flay the victim's face. After cutting around the victim's face, there is so much blood that the cartel member loses his grip as he is holding the victim's head up. This then results in the victim's head falling back on the concrete ground and as this happens, 
Blood sprays out, leaving a streak of blood on the wall. At this point, you see the victim is somehow still alive. You see him move and attempt to breathe. The cartel member then tries to lift the victim by the head, but he can't get a grip due to the insane amount of blood. The clip then jump cuts and it shows the victim lying on his side, and the cartel member cuts his neck from behind, attempting to behead him. It jump cuts once again, showing that the victim has now been decapitated and someone seems to kick the severed head across the room. The skin is flopping down due to the attempted flaying, and again the video jump cuts. This time showing the cartel member cutting vertically down the victim's chest and stomach, completely opening him up. You see the victim's intestines and layers of fat. It's honestly a very, very disturbing sight. The cartel member then decides to switch things up and he begins hacking away at the corpse's knees. At this point, the corpse is completely drained of blood and it's hard to explain, but in certain videos when this happens, the flesh looks completely different. I don't know, it's just hard to explain. The video then concludes with the victim hacked into pieces, disfigured, and completely disemboweled. All I can say is thankfully the video had no sound and was dubbed by music because I could only imagine the sounds that this video produced. The victim was almost dead at the start of the video, so who knows what took place before the camera was turned on. This video is absolutely awful and extremely bloody. Whatever you do, stay curious and never go searching for it. There's one haunted house that we need to have a discussion about, and it's the Haunted Hill House. This, in my opinion, could be the most haunted place in Texas and is one of the most haunted places in all of America. Now, this house is known to be a home to a demon named Toby, but we're going to talk about that later. First, let's talk about the history. The Hill House itself was supposedly a makeshift hospital in the 1900s, and a number of people died in there while being treated for various diseases. Inside of the home, there were also a couple of murders, including an infamous murder that occurred right here on these stairs. According to the owners, a man named Willie, who ran the brothel back in the day, had a son with one of the prostitutes named Elizabeth. Unfortunately, though, their son was born with Down syndrome, and Willie, eventually becoming frustrated with his son, beat him to death right in the upstairs. He also shot and killed the son's mother, Elizabeth, right here on the stairs. He shot her in the stomach, and her bloodstains are still visible on the stairs to this day. I mean, there's so much history we can cover in this TikTok, but they also have a room in the house where there are dolls hanging from nooses. I'm not kidding. Yeah, it's very, very creepy in there. Some of the past owners even practiced black magic in the house. There is a lot of history to unpack here. I also can't forget to mention that there was another murder in the home when a prostitute murdered her John and then killed herself in a bathtub. The upstairs of the house is home to a demon named Toby, and this picture claims to show him. And we talk about this in my YouTube video. I just spent the night there. It was one of the scariest nights of my life. That full video is available on YouTube now. But yeah, Toby the demon was supposedly conjured by some of the previous homeowners. And yeah, his presence is definitely felt in the upstairs. When we were up there, we were hearing literal growls echoing from the lower floor of the house. We caught all this on camera and I cannot explain it. It was very, very spooky. The entire upstairs, the attic area where Toby is supposed to live is just so unbelievably creepy and it does have these phantom EMF signals that were setting off some of our devices. There's also video footage that's been captured in the Hill House that literally shows an investigator pictured right here being yanked out of the bed. And I'm talking like somebody grabs her ankles and pulls her at full force out of the bed. It's one of the craziest things I've ever seen. There are also tons of people who have been scratched in this house, scratched so deeply that they actually bled through their shirt. And yeah, this place is just evil. Straight up, it's just evil. If you want to see the full documentary that I made about this house, we spent the entire night there ghost hunting. We interviewed the historian there. He gave us an hour-long tour going through all of the history, covered tons of stuff that I couldn't cover on this TikTok, other deaths and strange things that happened there, including the story of a young boy who was found hanging from a tree outside in the back of the house. That video is on my YouTube channel now, The Paranormal Files. I will warn you, I have had people that watch some of my videos and claim that spirits and energy can travel through the screen. We actually had that happen with a video that we posted a few months ago. It was pretty crazy. Lots of people reported having stuff happen after watching it. So yeah, check it out. Be careful when you check it out. Um, protect yourself just in case. This kid recorded himself before committing a school shooting and it's absolutely gut turning. This is Nicholas Cruz, and on February 14th, 2018, he shot up Parkland High School in Florida, killing 17 people and injuring another 17. And the video I'm about to show you shows Nicholas Cruz talking about it the day before he does it. 
This video is absolutely disturbing, especially when you know the aftermath. Hello. My name is Nick, and I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. My goal is at least 20 people with an AR-15 and a couple trace rounds. I think I can do a good time. Location is Stone Douglas in Parkland, Florida. It's going to be a big event and when you see me on the news you'll all know who i am <laughs> you're all going to die pew, 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 pew. Uh, yeah. can't wait today is the day the day that it be all begins the day of my massacre shall begin all the kids in school will run in fear and hide from the wrath of my power, they will know who I am. I am nothing. I am no one. My life is nothing and meaningless. Everything that I hold dear, I let go beyond your half. Every day, I see the world ending another day. I live a lone life, live in seclusion and solitude. I hate everyone and everything. With the power of my AR, you will all know who I am. I had enough of being told what to do and when to do. I had enough of being telling me that I'm an idiot and a dumbass. But in real life, you're all the dumbass. You're all stupid and brainwashed by these political government programs. You will all see, you will all know who my name is. My love for you, Angie, will never go away. I hope to see you in the afterlife. On one day or another, you will end and we'll all die. All right, so here's the plan. I'm going to go take an Uber in the afternoon before 2.40. From there, I'll go into the to school campus, walk up the stairs, load my bags. And this is the story of Issei Sagawa, a man who confessed to killing and eating a woman, but only got 15 months in jail. He's out there right now. Issei grew up in a fairly normal home. He said later in an interview though that he always knew that he was abnormal. Not quite right. Issei had a lot of strange fantasies from a very young age. Fantasies about eating people. Women. He said in an interview in the first grade he saw a girl wearing shorts and he remembered thinking that her leg looked delicious. And he wanted to, um, eat it. Bear in mind he was only six years old. Issei would eventually go off to university. He grew obsessed with this woman. He one day followed her home and waited for her to go to bed. But he, he didn't want to kill her, he just wanted to take a bite of her, um, her bottom. While breaking in, he wakes her up and because he was quite a small man, she was able to take him. She called the police, but charges were dropped because Issei's father had quite a lot of money. So his fantasies just grew. Issei went to France to pursue a PhD. He also knew at this point that it was his life goal to eat a woman. He actually admitted that almost every night he'd bring home a prostitute with the intention of killing them, but he would never do it. Each time he was too scared. That's until he met a girl in his class called Renee. Renee was said to be a very tall and beautiful Dutch girl. And for Issei, it was love at first bite. I mean sight. I wish I was joking. But Renee wasn't just beautiful. She was very intelligent and knew many languages. So Issei convinces her to tutor him in German. He offered to pay her good money and she agreed. But Issei had a plan and safe to say that plan was not learning German. So on the 11th of June, 1981, Issei invites Renee over. So Issei invites Renee to dinner. Little does she know she's the dinner. I'm sorry, that's not. Mm. Anyways, first Issei starts by confessing all of his love to Renee. He was completely infatuated with Renee, so he literally spilled it all in this last moment. But unfortunately for Issei, Renee did not feel the same. She saw him more as a really good friend at the time. So she politely shut him down and they moved on. That's when Issei asked her to read him a poem. And unfortunately for poor Renee, as she's reading this poem, Issei comes up behind her and shoots her. He then proceeded to faint. But then he woke up and he, um, 
Hmm. He ate Renee. Well, parts of her. And that is all I'm going to say about that. He eventually realizes that he has to dispose of her, so he puts her in two suitcases and calls a taxi. The taxi driver helps him with his bags and says, Oh, these are heavy. What you got in here, dead body? The taxi driver takes him to a very busy park. The park is busy, he freaks out, and he just leaves the suitcases in the open. Obviously, it's not long before someone looks at the suitcases and opens them. And they freaked out, understandably, and called the police. Loads of people reported seeing a smaller Asian man with these suitcases. The authorities then contact the cab companies and ask them if they've seen a man of this description with some heavy suitcases. And the taxi driver that took Issei was like, yeah, me. So it didn't take long for Issei to be found, exposed, you know. So the police show up to the door and do you know what he says? I killed her to eat her flesh. The French court system actually deemed him insane and he went to an institution. But eventually he was deported back to Japan. The Japanese doctors declare him sane and they tried to convict him of murder and bring him back to court. Should have mentioned this earlier, but when he was deemed insane by the French judge, he wasn't convicted for the murder. But they needed the court documents and the French just wouldn't send them. This bit kind of confuses me a bit. So they just never got the paperwork. Meaning they literally couldn't keep Issei in the institution. So he was able to check himself out and just live his life. So he only served 15 months in the institution. And now he's just out there in Japan living his life. I feel so bad for Renee's family. Like, how did this even happen? He literally confessed, but there were no documents to prove it. No evidence, no crime. And that's the story. Thanks for watching. An innocent victim of her mother's disorder, Munchausen by proxy, Olivia Gant suffered horrifically right up until her death, aged seven. At the age of two, Olivia was taken to hospital in Colorado by her mother, Kelly, saying that she needed treatment for severe constipation. She was treated successfully and sent home, but Kelly soon brought her back saying that she was now unable to consume food properly. Shockingly, the hospital did perform multiple surgeries, including fitting Olivia with an ileostomy bag. Over the next five years, Kelly took Olivia back to hospital over 1,000 times. She had three different feeding tubes fitted surgically at different times. Kelly also told doctors that Olivia was suffering from seizures, and shockingly, they prescribed anti-seizure medication, despite none of these doctors ever witnessing Olivia have a seizure. Kelly then started posting online, saying that her daughter Olivia was terminally ill. This was completely false, but obviously nobody knew that. And she quickly started to gain lots of attention and sympathy. She started holding multiple fundraisers to raise money for Olivia, including a Make-A-Wish party and a ride along with Denver Police and Fire Department. Kelly then demanded that Olivia's feeding tube be removed so that she could receive intravenous nutrition instead. Olivia had become extremely weak by this point and Kelly had asked Olivia's doctors to sign a do not resuscitate order. When they refused, she moved doctor again and again until she found one that would sign it. Olivia was placed on hospice care at Kelly's request and she quickly began to starve. She was only being given melted popsicle juice rubbed onto her lips with a sponge. Tragically, the last time Olivia's grandfather saw her, he said that she was lucid and she told him that she was hungry. Olivia died on August 20th, 2017, and her death was ruled as being caused by intestinal failure as a complication of one of her multiple medical conditions. After Olivia's death, Kelly then started taking one of her other daughters to hospital, complaining of similar problems to those that Olivia had, which were found to be false. Staff became suspicious, an investigation was opened, and in 2018, Kelly was arrested. It was discovered that due to all the fundraisers that Kelly had when Olivia was alive, she'd accumulated almost half a million dollars in donations. She'd scammed over 100 organisations and individuals. In 2022, Kelly pleaded guilty to a felony charge of child abuse that caused her daughter's death. She took a plea deal in which a first degree murder charge was dismissed and she received 16 years in prison. 
She was also found guilty of felony theft and fraud charges, in which she received a 13-year sentence to run concurrently. Kelly later claimed that she was innocent of all charges and still to this day professes her innocence. She says that she only pleaded guilty to spare her family from a lengthier trial. 215 unalived bodies have recently been discovered buried behind a Mississippi jail, put there presumably by law enforcement and their deaths uninvestigated. Families not made aware. Hi, I'm Meg, I talk about your crime. Let's get into this case. This case is very, very new, so I'm giving you all the information I can find. I can't even tell you when exactly they found this grave, but it was in the past month, and people are angry. This grave was referred to as a pauper's grave. Every person buried there only had a metal rod with a number on it, no name, nothing. And when they started identifying these bodies, the families had no idea that they were even dead. They thought they were just missing. They were waiting for them to come home. Yet this whole time they're buried in an unmarked grave behind a jail in Jackson, Mississippi, excuse me. The graves were presumably put there by law enforcement, meaning all 215 victims were deaths that weren't investigated. Families were not made aware. They buried them without asking anyone. Among the deceased was a man called Dexter Wade. This whole time his family thought he was missing, but turns out he was actually hit by a police car and buried back there. And it's not like the police couldn't identify him because he literally had his ID in his pocket and he was buried with it, which is why he was one of the first to be identified. And to add more suspicion to this whole thing, Dexter's uncle was actually unalived by these police officers and they were currently undergoing a whole lawsuit with it. So was Dexter a targeted attack or did they do it by accident and then realized that he was related to this guy and we're like, uh-oh. Either way, there's absolutely no excuse. He was thrown away like like trash. Like all of those victims were put in like bags and they weren't even like embalmed or anything. So you can imagine that it didn't smell great. Also because they weren't embalmed and stuff, like it's really hard to figure out the cause of death and all that. It takes a lot longer because decomposition. This whole thing is just so like sketch, like the way that it's being dealt with. No one wants to comment on it. No one wants to speak on it. Someone who's looking into the case was quoted saying that he doesn't really know why these people were killed, whether it be racism or prejudice. He's just trying to figure out their cause of death first, presumably to see if there's any sort of link between the victims. The 215 victims weren't of a particular race. Some were white, some were black, Hispanic, Native American. I just can't imagine like the families, think about it. You thought that this person was missing this whole time, someone that you love, and then just to find out that they've been like thrown away in an unmarked grave without your permission, put there by law enforcement, who's meant to investigate things like this unless they themselves did it, which is starting to kind of look like that just a little bit. These are guys you're like meant to be able to trust, you know, like it's so messed up, but I still can hardly find anything about it. And it just seems like, I don't know. I just, I hope they're taking it seriously and that they put the effort into finding the families of all 215 victims. I mean, they definitely have a case with the Dexter Wade thing because like that is clearly a crime. It doesn't actually say how they found out that it was a police officer that hit him, but I'm sure that'll come out later. I also hope that the families are able to get proper burials for their loved ones without having to pay because I heard that they were like protesting against the fact that they have to pay for it. And I'm sorry, but what? Um, they should not have to pay for that, I don't think, after everything. I really hope that this is looked into properly because the victim's families definitely <laughs> deserve it at this point. I think that, you know, the police department needs a little bit of looking into. But yeah, that's everything I could find on this case so far. If you want updates, make sure you give me a follow. Let's not let this case die and go quiet because I think these families deserve more than that. So make sure you share because I will be following this case because I want to see it through. Like I want something to be done about it. I say case when really it's like 215 people, 215 cases here. Um, and I think that so many people see that number and they don't actually realize like 215 people. Imagine them all standing in front of you. Like, that is a lot of people who were thrown away like trash in a field. Not even given, like, a gravestone with a name on it. A number. They were given a number. It's, like, so 
so messed up. If true crime is something you like, make sure you check out this playlist and also give me a follow. I do other videos not related to true crime as well, so make sure you check those out. Get to know me better. They never do as well though, so yeah, just letting you know. That's all for today. I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Was Grant Solomon hit by his own truck or was he murdered? The details surrounding his case are really strange and the only person who witnessed his death is the one person who Grant was scared of the most, his abusive father. Hi, um, I'm Grant Solomon's mom. Uh, my name is Angie and we are here uh, at a tough spot, but it's where my son's body was found, right here in this ditch. Before we jump in, it's important to know the family dynamic. Grant and his sister Gracie have claimed for many years they were being abused by their estranged father, Aaron, and Grant actually reported the abuse to his school, but shortly after, he mysteriously died. Their mom, Angie, has also been abused by Aaron in the past, so their relationship with him was volatile. July 20th, 2020 was the first time that Grant had been alone with his dad in two years, as he and his sister lived with their mom. And on that visit at a baseball training club in Gallatin, Tennessee, Grant would be killed in what Aaron described as a freak accident. But the details don't seem to add up. Uh, my my son's truck backed over him, and he, it's rolled over him and dragged him into the ditch, and it's on top of it. He's trapped under the truck, and I, I yeah, he, I, he I, somehow it drug him underneath it. Yes, my son is under it. I'm trying to no, I'm I'm trying to call 911. According to Aaron, Grant was getting out of his 2015 Toyota Tacoma at the top of the parking lot as he looked away. When he looked back, the next thing he saw was the truck rolling back, dragging Grant against the asphalt, and then rolling back into part of the road before somehow ending back up in a rocky ditch. During the 911 call placed by Aaron, he said three men were helping Grant, who was trapped under the truck, but the identity of those men have never been revealed, and they have never come forward. Aaron also refused to go and sit with his dying son until paramedics arrived. When the Gallatin Police Department arrived, they found Grant under the front of his truck on his back between the tires with his feet toward the road. He didn't have any road rash on his body that indicated that he was dragged on asphalt, and he also didn't have any burns on his body, which he likely would have had if he was trapped under a hot truck that had just driven over an hour to get there. There were no marks in the grass that indicated a vehicle had driven through it, and the clothes and shoes that Grant was wearing at the time were completely undamaged, which again seems very unlikely had he actually been dragged by his truck like Aaron said. Aaron told police that the truck malfunctioned, which is why it must have rolled, but the truck was found in park with the keys still in the ignition. Grant was taken to the hospital where he died not long after. At the hospital, Aaron refused an autopsy before Grant's mom could get there. She was an hour away. And when Angie first saw Aaron at the hospital, the first thing that he said to her was, we're gonna be a family now. According to the medical examiner, Grant's official cause of death was cardiac arrest due to blunt force trauma to the head. The only injuries on Grant's body was a blow to his jaw and a fatal blow to the back of his head, which doesn't really seem to add up with what Aaron said happened. Despite all of this strange evidence, the Gallatin Police Department just took Aaron's word on what happened and Many people believe that this is because of Aaron's well-known status in the community. He used to be a TV anchor in Nashville. Further adding to the mystery, Aaron refused examination and forensic analysis of Grant's truck during the initial investigation to determine if it had actually malfunctioned. And 48 hours after Grant's death, Aaron picked up his truck and drove it home and continued to drive it for months after, which is odd behavior for someone who thinks that the truck malfunctioned and killed his son. He then refused to give it back to Grant's mom and sister and eventually had it secretly sent to a scrapyard to be totaled and sold at auction. But luckily, just before it was sold, Angie tracked it down and was able to save it. But the odd part is that Aaron had taken it to a dealership where they reported minor damage, but he somehow convinced an insurance adjuster to have the truck listed as totaled. And when that insurance adjuster was finally tracked down and informed of the investigation into Grant's death, he stated that he doesn't release documents pertaining to clients and that they would have to be obtained through a subpoena. He even went as far as saying, how did you find me? Angie later had the truck analyzed by a private team, and that exam concluded that the truck was in good working order and that the accident could not have happened as Aaron described. Furthermore, there was dried blood spatter on the inside of the truck. If Grant was dragged by his truck and killed the way Aaron said, how did blood end up on the inside of the truck? One of Grant's baseball bats mysteriously disappeared from his truck after the fact too. 
At the crime scene, Grant's glasses, which he wore 24-7, otherwise he couldn't see, were found up by the sidewalk, which indicates that that's where he was last standing, not at the top of the parking lot. And just below his glasses was a bloody rock. Grant's phone data showed that he was never at the top of the parking lot like Aaron said, and after his death, his phone disappeared for an entire day. But during that time, his Life360 showed that someone had his phone, and it turns out that Aaron was the one who had his phone. But when he returned it to Angie the next night, it was completely shattered. Despite all of this and the many inconsistencies in the official police report, the Gallatin Police Department concluded that Grant's death was accidental and closed the case. But Grant's mom and sister, Angie and Gracie, both believed that Aaron was involved in Grant's death and that he was murdered. Since then, Gracie bravely posted a YouTube video detailing how she was sexually abused by her father and how Grant, who was also abused, was scared of him. But Aaron has not been charged in his son's death or his daughter's abuse. He states that it's all part of a smear campaign against him, but according to Angie, Aaron once confessed to murdering Grant. A change.org petition was created to get the Gallatin Police Department to reopen and reinvestigate the case, so please consider signing and sharing. There's also a GoFundMe for Grant's family to help continue funding a private investigation. And to take it a step further, these are three people who hold a lot of power that can help reopen an investigation into Grant's death. Please consider reaching out to them to help get Grant and his family the justice they deserve. I am Angie Solomon. I am not any of the things that you've been told I am. You can believe what you want. I could care less. What we want to know is what happened to Grant, what happened to my son. Imagine getting married only to be decapitated by your husband three months later. 21-year-old couple Jared and Angie got married in October 2022. Around 4 p.m. on the 11th of January, police were called to their home in Texas. Police made a grim discovery in the pair's bathroom after finding, quote, what appeared to be the head of the victim to be in the shower, end quote. Angie's body was discovered on the floor near the bed in a pool of blood with multiple stab wounds to her back. It was actually Jared's poor parents that initially made this discovery after entering the home. They then obviously alerted police to what they found. Jared was arrested and has confessed to killing his wife with a kitchen knife. Jared was actually captured on CCTV, casually stealing a bottle of beer from Angie's workplace just minutes after it's believed that he killed her. Angie's friends have reported to police that the couple's relationship was toxic and Jared was very controlling. Jared's bond is currently set at $500,000. Not watch this video unless you have a very strong stomach. This case is truly sickening. On August the 31st, 2019, Margaret Sumney was unreachable. Her family knew something was wrong. They tried and failed to get hold of her for two days before notifying police to ask them to do a welfare check. When police went to her house in Pennsylvania, what they discovered was horrifying. They found shattered glass all over the floor and blood smeared on the walls. They found the 67 year old's body in the bath. She'd been beaten to death. The autopsy revealed that she died from blunt force trauma to the head. Police interviewed her son, David, who initially denied having anything to do with her death. However, police searched his phone and found absolutely disgusting images. They uncovered 277 sickening pictures, including selfies of David with her body, his face smeared in her blood and doing a thumbs up pose. Police also discovered that David was in possession of his mum's jewellery and several blank checks. He also had a record of previously assaulting his mother twice and attacking his now deceased father once. The same year as his mum's murder, he allegedly waterboarded and strangled his ex-girlfriend in an Atlantic City hotel. It's reported though that he just slipped through the cracks in the police databases, allowing him to go on to offend again. He was soon arrested and it was found that when he'd committed the murder of his mother, he'd taken a large amount of Adderall. His defence argued that he had diminished responsibility due to his substance and alcohol use. Originally, he was facing charges of first-degree murder and abuse of a corpse. However, due to a legal loophole, he entered a guilty plea, so he would only be charged with third-degree murder. He was sentenced to 20 to 40 years in prison. Terrifyingly, as he's now been in prison since 2019, and due to his good behaviour behind bars, he could be released in just 17 years. This island has one of the most disturbing histories in America, and no one really knows the full truth behind it. So like I said before, this island was owned by multi-millionaire Francis Shelvin, pictured right here. 
And Francis and a number of other local men from Michigan, including this guy, Gerald S. Richards, ran a boys camp on the island. They would fly kids to the island on this airstrip, kids from the YMCA and other schools and communities in the area. And both the children and the parents of the children who attended this boys camp were told that this was an island of fun where kids could relax. They had big brothers there. It was going to be totally safe. And this camp ran on this island for a period of years. Then one day, some of the kids who attended the camp began to tell their parents that the counselors or the teachers, the adults that were there on the island, had behaved with them in very, very inappropriate ways. They began telling their friends and parents that they were taken into these cabins pictured here on the island. They were assaulted. They were told to remove all of their clothing and that there were cameras all over the place. Well, it turns out that this guy, the multi-millionaire with political and business connections in the area, Francis Sheldon, was running a massive CP ring. And they had been abusing the children on this island under the guise of bringing them to a boys camp for years, recording all of it, selling it across the world. And some of the more affluent clients of their business were even allowed to take trips to the island themselves to see some of these young boys. Now, this story bears an obvious resemblance to the story of Jeffrey Epstein, but there are some very, very strange things that are happening here that nobody knows about and the government still refuses to talk about to this day. So let's talk about this guy, Gerald S. Richards. He was a gym teacher at a local Catholic school who went down for the crimes and he was heavily involved with every aspect of this business, if you know what I mean. Well, it seems like through his political and business connections, Francis Sheldon was actually tipped off that he was about to be arrested and raided and charged with these horrific crimes. So Francis, before he could be brought to justice for these crimes, he actually fled the country in a personal plane. He then moved to France, got remarried and died in Amsterdam and never had to pay for any of the crimes that were committed here. But it's when we start talking about the murders that this story really starts to blow my mind. So take a good look at this guy, Chris Bush. This is Christopher Bush's father, Harold Lee Bush. Now, he was an executive with General Motors and the family was obviously extremely wealthy. They were politically connected and they were very connected to every business in the area. These guys had a lot of power. But back to Christopher Bush, this guy had assaulted a number of children. He'd been let out of prison, let out of jail in a very, very suspicious way, multiple times put on bail for serious offenses. And he was a alleged associate of the crime ring that was happening on North Fox Island. Meaning that, like I said earlier, he was one of those people who could afford to actually fly out to the island to do things himself. I'm out of time. Follow for part three. This is where it gets juicy. This little girl got revenge on her killer from beyond the grave. On the 25th of January 2005, Katie Coleman finished school and went back to her home in Indiana, United States. Katie was 10 years old and lived with her mum and dad and sister. At 3pm that day, her mum asked her to go to the dollar store to get toilet roll. Now Katie knew the area well and it wasn't really far to go. After getting the toilet roll from the shop, Katie stopped at the bank to get a lollipop for her way home. However, when Katie's dad returned home, the little girl still wasn't back. Her parents called police and a few days later an Amber Alert was issued. A witness came forward to say that they'd seen a girl who looked like Katie in a truck. The driver was described as a skinny white man about six feet tall with short dark hair and fair complexion. Tragically, five days after going missing, Katie's body was found. It was in a creek just a few miles from her home. Disturbingly, her hands and feet were tied and she had been essayed. It was determined that her cause of death had been drowning. 20-year-old Charles Hickman rang the police to confess. He said he and another man had abducted Katie after she'd witnessed a substance deal. He said they tried to scare her into not saying anything and they tied her up, but she ended up falling in and drowning. Disgustingly, this turned out to be a false confession. This obviously wasted police time and caused massive amounts of distress to Katie's family. Police continued to look for evidence and they did find a cigarette butt near to Katie's body. They tested it for DNA and it matched a man called Anthony Stockelman. Police compared the DNA on the cigarette butt to the DNA on Katie's body and it was a match. Anthony, a father of two young boys, was in the area that day visiting his mother. He entered a guilty plea and was given life in prison without parole. But this is not the only punishment that Anthony would receive. Now, Anthony claims that he was under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance during the crime. He said this is because his father had died six months prior. Regardless, Anthony was imprisoned. 
Unlucky for Anthony, he was actually housed in a prison with Katie's cousin. Jared Harris was serving a sentence for burglary and was in the same wing as Anthony. Jared forcibly tattooed the words Katie's revenge across Anthony's forehead. He wanted to brand Anthony for life for killing his young cousin. This is one of the most horrific cases I've heard recently, so please be warned before watching. 29-year-old Taylor Parker has just been sentenced to death for a crime so horrendous that I can't believe a human is capable of this. Regan Simmons Hancock and Taylor had met online. Their online friendship soon blossomed into a real-life connection. It was 2022 and Regan was married with a young daughter. She was also eight months pregnant at this time. Taylor was also pregnant, or so it would seem to the outside world. She was posting pregnancy pictures on social media and even hosted a gender reveal party. Little did her loved ones know that she was actually staging the entire thing. Regan and Taylor were really good friends around this time and they were bonding over their pregnancies. Regan even shared a Facebook status thanking Taylor for bringing her around a gift and Starbucks. This was the day before she would be murdered by Taylor. On Taylor's supposed due date, she made her way round to Regan's house in Texas. Shortly after, Regan's mum made a horrifying discovery. Her daughter was face down on the floor, deceased with blood everywhere. Her mum rang the emergency services and they raced to the scene. It became apparent that her baby had been, and again, a massive, massive trigger warning here, ripped out of her stomach and Regan had been stabbed over a hundred times. Meanwhile, Taylor was pulled over for speeding and driving erratically. She'd actually put the baby in her lap with the umbilical cord coming out of her trousers to make it seem like she'd just given birth. When the pair were taken to hospital, the horrors of what actually happened became apparent. The newborn baby tragically passed away and Taylor was arrested. She was sentenced to death, but her defense lawyer said that her loved ones should have done more to protect her earlier on when she was pretending to be pregnant.